Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me uh, to share today's message, God's message with you. Uh, the title of my message is Embracing Our Identity. And the scripture passage was just read to us from Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Uh, before we go into the subject, uh, let me explain to you why did Paul write this particular letter. Uh, remember, Paul is in prison and he's unable to visit the, the uh, unable to visit the flock in Philippi. And therefore, he decides to write a letter. Uh, what was the purpose of the letter? I want, I want everyone to understand what was the purpose of the letter. Well, there were three purposes why Paul wrote it. First and foremost, his primary purpose was to thank the, the members in the, at Philippi for their kindness and for their continued help and support in helping him, especially in difficult times. Uh, there was also a second reason why Paul wrote it, and that is he was preparing the congregation for for a situation that most likely is going to occur sooner or later and that is persecution persecution was on the horizon and paul sensed it and he he wanted to forewarn them and prepare them and so he urges them to work together as one team as one family and there is one large uh, one last reason why paul wrote the letter and that is in the process of encouraging the members to work together he addresses uh, the concerns of the church. He addresses the conflict in the church. So that, that is the background. And with this background, let's move into our uh, passage. Let me give you an overview of what uh, uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 13 is. Uh, we, there are many things you can learn, but there are three useful insights which I want to emphasize. The first is we get a picture of what the what the congregation experienced and then that is from verses 1 to 4 and then from verses 5 to 11 we have a second component and that is the we we are privileged to read the content of a hymn that was used in worship services at that particular time and finally in the last 12 and 13 uh, we, we we see how leaders confront conflicts uh, that is a broad overview. Now let's uh, uh, move into the uh, section. Uh, the Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 to 13 begins this way. Uh, Paul says, Paul addresses a particular problem and see how he, how he begins. This section begins with therefore. Therefore. This means there is a thought in the earlier, in the earlier passage. If you backtrack a few verses, you will know that Paul urged the Philippians to walk in a manner worthy of their gospel. Now what follows is Paul's exhortation to do just that. Paul confronts the internal problems in the church by exhorting them to, re to remain united and through unity in Christ. Uh, Paul begins by laying a foundation uh, presented in four ifs, IFS. Now, look at the statement. There are four ifs. Each statement is, is pinpointing to one particular aspect. Now, let's look at this. Each study, each, uh, what you call ifs, point to an experience, a shared experience the congregation went to, went through. We'll see what that is. Basically, what Paul is th telling through these four ifs is that you have a solid foundation of unity. And you need to build on and you need to grow in grace. His desire is that they will remain united and one and that no conflicts will overtake them and they will lose and they will become a divided church. So what we understand is Paul's main focus is unity in Christ to help them not to be divided but to, but to stay united and in the process the differences will get automatically ironed out. Let's look at each of these four statements with an eye for our own for our own selves today. We too could have a look at this and ask ourselves, is our foundation in Christ for unity so well grounded? Let's see. Let's look at the first uh, statement, if statement. 
the first statement first is if statement says if you have any encouragement from being united with christ let's stop uh, paul is asking them to focus on one particular thing uh, the unity with christ paul is bringing to their attention what it means to be a christian brethren where is one's true identity as a christian we need to ask and paul is emphasizing a fundamental fact he's saying paul puts it this way uh, we all know our true identity is found only in christ and paul puts it this way he says united with christ that's fundamental that's foundational have you has have you ever asked what makes a christian what is the first thing that you remember Paul is saying that the fundamental and the foundational answer to that question is that we are Christians because we are united with Christ. Everything we do or don't do flows from that fact. Our identity is in the very being of the eternal son who has his identity in the relationship with his father. Brethren, our union is in Christ and therefore our unity with one another is found only in Christ. Uh, i remember this the song a favorite song uh, which christian sing it's a timeless song on christ the solid on on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking stand brethren paul is re reminding the flock at philippi that they are on solid ground of unity and they need to build on this they were anchored to to the author of life christ himself and let's look at the second if if you have any comfort from his love it reads like this paul is reminding them to the past when they experienced comfort from his love them the key word to understand is his it is not human love it is not corporate love it is not love from fellow human beings but it is a love that flows from christ himself the congregation shared the experience of christ's love today we have many distorted views of what love is for the thrift for us christians love is found defined and experienced only in christ paul wants the church to remember this fundamental fact and how they they got the blessings of comfort for jesus identity was secured in knowing that he was the beloved son of the father all he did and went through was sustained in his love in christ we are not given some sentimental feel good story but the reality of the love of the father the son and the spirit we are given a share in the love of the son and the father and for his father we are also given a share of the father's love in the son brethren it is an eternal love that is shared with us and we are united with christ this is a foundational comfort that that can that can help you resolve the problems if you know that you are if you enjoy god's love you will automatically want it to flow to others and help others loving others tends flows automatically brethren this is the love that we long for uh, ravi zakaria the brilliant uh, christian apologist uh, puts it very beautifully uh, i remember i heard him once he says you see in our english language we have only one word love we say i love my dog i love my house and i love my family but the greek it is not so with the greeks the greeks had four different words for love they had agape love god, divine love or godly love and then it is unconditional love and then you have storge or now what you call protective love or parental love and then you have uh, uh, philoro i hope i got it correct brotherly love or uh, friendly love and then you have eros the romantic love and uh, uh, dr zakar dr uh, ravi zakaria concludes that all the other three loves storge philoro and eros cannot exist or they cannot be expressed properly and fully unless they are pegged on to agape love brethren we understand the importance of god's love only when god fills his love with us we will be able to love we will be able to express love to others and share his love to let's move on to the third if 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 you have any common sharing in the spirit it says it is talking about our fellowship our fellowship in the church paul is bringing to their remembrance 
how the Holy Spirit brought about fellowship. Fellowship in the Spirit is much deeper than anything we can accomplish on our own. The fellowship of the Spirit we share is something that God shares His love with us. It's a fellowship that is received, not achieved. True fellowship is not some ideal thing to be in the making. Brethren, when you and I have fellowship, when we, are, when we have fellowship in the Spirit, we are united with the triune Father, Son, the Spirit. And we are, we are also shared this fellowship with one another, with our brothers and sisters. It, this is a beautiful uh, foundation. It brings out the freedom and the wholeness we have in our relationships. And we can relax at the fact that we can lose our controlling grips and shaping fellowship. But then the key to understand is we trust God to guide us in all our relationships. Yes, somebody may not understand your love. Somebody may not understand your fellowship. They may not reciprocate it. But let's leave it to the spirit and God takes care of it. And he will create the bonds of fellowship that we so much longed for. And one last thing, one last if is, if there is any tenderness and compassion, Paul qualifies the statement by saying any tenderness and compassion, any is an evidence or indication of the spirit working in us. The church at Philippi may be going through difficulties at the moment, but Paul wants them to think back in the past how they experienced tremendous compassion and sympathy for one another when they were united and when they enjoyed uh, when they enjoyed the fellowship of one another uh, these are all i mean qualities that god gives you and you begin to share with them paul wants them to remember a time when they shared their warm heartedness uh, towards one another but where does this warm heartedness and uh, kindness stem from uh, we too can re recall our warm heartedness uh, I think it's, it definitely stems from our fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Spirit. It is not a warm feelings per se in the past, but remembering the presence of Christ in us. <coughs> Brethren, tenderness and compassion are manifested in our relationships with others. It is one more indicator that we are united with Christ. Now, let's summarize all the four if statements. You see, there are four statements. And what Paul is doing is, he is laying a foundation for them and telling them you are on solid ground of unity. All you have to do is build on this. Look at the first statement. It says, now, united with Christ. The second if, it says, now, the, his love, Christ's love. <coughs> and the third one is fellowship in the spirit. And the last one is tenderness and manifestation. And then Paul goes on uh, to conclude his statements then then work ahead and then build on these things and he says make my joy complete being like-minded being having the same love being one in spirit and one in mind uh, paul wants to build on the foundation that he has uh, that he has enlightened them and now he wants them to continue to be strong and united so that they are able to face the storms of life. They are able to face their differences, their selfishness and their pride. Uh, look, it says, no, having this, be like-minded. Paul wants that you and I will be like-minded like Christ. Paul wants that we will have, we will be like-minded with Jesus Christ. And how was Jesus Christ? He was compassionate. He was tender. He was warm. He was loving. His love flowed to all. He was all, all the way helping and serving others. And Paul wants us similarly to grow in that way. Brethren, when you and I are focused on, on our foundation and we remember that God is working in us, it will be easy for you to handle your differences. It will be easy to handle your petty, petty problems. And that is why <coughs> now Paul goes on to tell them how to handle it. Remember, he tells you, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, Paul, after having laid a foundation for them, telling them how they were strong in you, unitedly, he tells them, go ahead. Don't act out of selfishness. Don't act out of pride. Because, see, selfishness and pride destroys the unity in the church. They are the essence of sin. 
And Paul is asking you to be, don't do that. Go ahead and learn to behave like how Christ behaved. Brethren, Paul is reminding us of who we are in Christ. We are united with Christ. Jesus' identity is wrapped up in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Since Jesus shares his life and identity in the triune God of love with us, we too are encouraged to share what he is. We share his love in our relationship with our Heavenly Father and in our relationship with one another. And now Paul, having told them what their foundation was, having urged them to move on and to build on that, now Paul switches over to a hymn is bringing to their attention a hymn that was apparently circulated and sung in the worships of congregation. It is found from verses 6 to 11. Uh, Paul turns to him that may have been circulated and sung. Paul wants us to become like Christ. He uses this hymn about Christ becoming like us. This is a beautiful and a powerful hymn, full of deep Christology. Through this hymn, Paul is driving the point that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Although Jesus is God, he lives out his life in the flesh as a man. In contrast to Adam, Jesus is not uh, living by grasping to be God. He, he rests in receiving from the Father his identity by the Spirit. We see Jesus living a life of humility, obedience and sacrifice. Jesus shows us what it means to be truly human. Brethren, as fallen creatures, you and I are unable to live in this humble life of obedience, service, and sacrifice. But Jesus lived it for us and is now sharing that life with us by the Spirit. And then Paul concludes his, uh, his, uh, his um, passage by calling upon the members for action. Paul calls his members to faithful obedience. He pleads with them. He makes a fervent appeal and he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and, and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Brethren, Paul is not telling us to imitate Jesus as if Jesus were just a role model. No, he is encouraging the members in the church at Philippi to work out in the spirit what Jesus has already worked out for them by the spirit. In other words, Paul is calling upon the members to participate in a reality, not create one of their own. And so brethren, you and I too cannot, cannot seize our identity in Christ. Paul is calling them and he's calling us, you and me, to embrace an identity as the one body united with, with Christ. Amen.